All right, we're going to kick it off. Good morning, Admiral Drugan, Captain Kraft, former commanding officers, executive directors, distinguished guests, teammates, family, and friends. Welcome to the Naval Support Facility Indian Head Stump Neck Annex. Home to the Naval Surface Warfare Center, Indian Head, Explosive Ordnance Disposal, Technology Divisions, EOD Department, and Expeditionary Exploitation Unit 1. I'm Keith Plumador. I'll be your Master of Ceremonies today. Will the guests please rise for the National Anthem, followed by the invocation. Lieutenant Dan Davis, NSWC Indian Head EOD Technology Division, EXU-1 Operations Officer, will now offer the invocation. Please join me in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you uh, for this beautiful cloud cover to uh, block the heat of the sun so uh, we can uh, stand here and uh, dedicate uh, this memorial, uh, this, this, uh, this piece of history, Lord. Uh, we thank you so much that we're able to uh, come together with our families uh, to not only remember those who have sacrificed so much in service of this country, but also to celebrate uh, the work that is done here uh, so our families can see uh, the, the work that we do here in, in honor of the fallen Lord. And uh, we thank you so much for our guest speaker, uh, Brad, and, uh, and his sacrifice. And we thank you that, uh, that he's here today to, uh, to share with us uh, everything. Lord, we ask you to uh, continue to bless the day, bless the rest of our day here, uh, bless the family time, and uh, we thank you again for your many wonderful blessings. In your name, amen. Will the guests please be seated? <clears throat> On behalf of the EOD Department and EOD Expeditionary Exploitation Unit 1, welcome once again to the 2017 EOD Dedication Ceremony and Family Day. As I said earlier, I'm Keith Plumador, your MC for today's event, but I also have a day job. I'm the EOD department head here at NSWC, Indian Head EOD Tech Division. Before we begin, I want to get a few acronyms out of the way because although that's the way we communicate in the Department of Defense, it's gibberish for most of you. Uh, so I'm going to try to simplify that for you. When you hear EOD, it stands for Explosive Ordnance Disposal. When you hear NSWC, it stands for Naval Surface Warfare Center. When you hear EXU-1, that stands for Expeditionary Exploitation Unit 1. Shortening those is going to save me a lot of time up here. So with those out of the way, I want to start by extending a special thanks to the family members, friends, and guests who came out today to spend some time with us. We appreciate the time you took to be here, celebrate with us, and hopefully learn a little more about what exactly your loved ones do when they come to work here every day. Like the Willy Wonka Chocolate Factory, we normally keep this place buttoned up pretty tight. But we've made some special arrangements today to open the doors for you so you can see firsthand what the civilians, soldiers, airmen, and Marines and sailors do here on this peninsula every day, and you'll leave here proud of what these dedicated patriots do on behalf of our nation. Today's all about you, the friends and family members, so please take full advantage. Feel free to dig in and ask any questions you may have during the tours and the demonstrations, participate in the various activities we've got down at the Helo Pad, and most importantly, have some fun getting to learn about the work we do here and the great people who make it happen. I want to especially thank our leadership for their attendance today, Admiral Drugan, Captain Kraft, we deliberately made this event informal because we want you to simply attend and enjoy it without having to do anything other than just show up. Uh, so please enjoy the day as members of the big EOD team and spend some time getting to know our people better and their families. Thanks again for being here. To kick it off, I want to take a few minutes to share some of the history of this place with you and its organization. 
There have been many name and organizational changes over the year that may be fascinating to some historians, but I think you'd be bored with me reciting all of that. So I've condensed that history to some of the key things that I think will resonate with you and show you the, the significance of what goes on here. Many of your friends and loved ones will have spent major parts of their lives here, and it's important for you to know and understand exactly what they've been a part of. As we gather to recognize EOD technicians who gave their all in carrying out the EOD mission, it's appropriate to take this opportunity to contemplate how circumstance brought us to this isolated and picturesque peninsula on the Potomac almost exactly 70 years ago. When you navigate your way here through rural southern Maryland and finally find this place, with its peaceful wooded scenery and the single roadway navigating the base, you wouldn't think much is going on here. But this little annex has been both directly and indirectly integrated into many of the most important and transformational military events experienced by the United States. The EOD elements of NSWC Indian Head EOD Technology Division can trace their origins back to the earliest days of World War II, when the U.S. Navy recognized the need for a capability to counter emerging threats from advanced and more complex weapon systems being developed by other nations. Born out of the Blitzkrieg of Great Britain in 1939, where the German Luftwaffe was not only dropping bombs that in some cases failed to explode, but also ordnance that was purposefully designed to cause maximum chaos and anxiety with designs that included anti-withdrawal, anti-disturbance, time delay, and magnetically induced fusing. This exceedingly hazardous situation presented a setting requiring some highly skilled technical expertise and specialized tools and equipment to cope with that treacherous threat. In May 1941, the Naval Mine Disposal School was established in Washington, D.C., and later that year, the Naval Bomb Disposal School was also established. Throughout World War II, these schools produced skilled technicians, techniques, and equipment necessary to carry the unexploded ordnance fight to the enemy. In post-World War II, 1945, both schools were consolidated to form the Naval EOD School and Unit, established under the Naval Ordnance Laboratory. The original mission statement of the school back in 1945, amazingly, still provides an accurate depiction of today's mission. That mission statement read in part, quote, provide for the training of men from the armed forces to identify, analyze, render safe, and dispose of any known form of explosive ordnance. Graduates of the school are to be placed in key positions throughout the world and are returned periodically for refresher courses due to the constantly changing field of ordnance. The mission of the EOD unit is to have available at any hour of the day or night a unit equipped with technical ordnance specialists and the latest equipment ready to cope with any explosive ordnance disposal problem anywhere in the world. That mission remains unchanged today. During August of 1946, both the school and unit were relocated to the Naval Powder Factory in Indian Head, Maryland. An important component of the school and unit was the Ordnance Investigation Lab, established here at the Stump Neck Annex in June of 1947. This is the origin of our 70 years of EOD history at Stump Neck. That lab was tasked to develop standardized procedures, tools, and equipment to support the operational EOD force, and it is the exact same mission that we have today. In 1951, the Department of Defense assigned the U.S. Navy with responsibility for joint service EOD research and development. Initially accomplished by the Naval EOD School, in 1953 a separate organization, the Naval EOD Technical Center, was established to accomplish those R&D tasks. By the mid-1950s, the Naval Explosive Ordnance Disposal Technology Center staff grew to include civilian engineers and support technicians. As an aside, not directly related to EOD, but I think an important historical note about Stump Neck during this time period, is that on the 24th of July in 1954, James Trexler, an engineer in the Radio Countermeasures Branch at the Naval Research Laboratory, spoke carefully into a microphone at the lab's Stump Neck radio antenna facility. Two and a half seconds later, his words came back to him at Stump Neck after traveling 500,000 miles via an Earth-Moon circuit. For the first time ever, the, the sound of a human voice had been transmitted beyond the ionosphere and returned to Earth. That event happened about 200 yards in the woods behind Building 2172, right over here to my left. And though nature has reclaimed much of the 260-foot parabolic dish that was carved into the Earth, the remains are still plainly visible today. In 1962, the EOD Technology Center was formally placed under the direction of a commanding officer and renamed as the Naval EOD Facility. Following congressional notice in 1969 regarding the individual service efforts, the Department of Defense directed that all joint EOD research and development be consolidated under the Secretary of the Navy as a single manager to eliminate duplication of effort. 
A joint program was then developed by the services that ensured all of their interests were addressed and the governing DOD Directive 5160.62 was first issued in 1971, designating SECNAV as the single manager for EOD technology and training, a designation that continues to this day. In 1999, the Navy relocated the EOD school from Indian Head to Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, geographically separating the training and technology elements of the EOD program after nearly 50 years of co-location here in Southern Maryland. Most recently, in September of 2013, the then NAVIO detective here at Stumpneck merged with the then NSWC Indian Head, resulting in the EOD detective becoming the EOD department within the new NSWC Indian Head EOD Technology Division Command. The command's EOD arm, EOD detective as it's still known inside the EOD community, exists for one purpose, best captured in our poignant motto, keep them off the wall. The assembled team of military operators, civilian engineers, scientists, and technicians has a solemn mission to put the best equipment and information into the hands of forward deployed EOD warriors across all U.S. military services, as well as to support our interagency and our foreign partners. There is a real sense of urgency about the work accomplished here, since our success or failure is measured by the list of names on the wall. And you'll be hearing more about that wall from Master Chief Borkenheim in a few minutes. With that long and proud history as a backdrop, Commander Duba and I wanted to also give you a very brief introduction to our specific parts of this organization in order to set the stage for you and hopefully put into context some of the things you're going to see as the day progresses. The EOD Department's big picture mission here remains exactly what it was those 70 years ago, to produce and provide EOD information, specialized tools and equipment, and logistics support to the nation's EOD warfighters with the singular goal of keeping them off the wall. There are currently just over 5,000 EOD technicians in all four military services, and these very special service members depend on us. When you consider the total size of the U.S. military is about 1.3 million active duty personnel, you see just how distinctive this group is, less than one half of 1%. The EOD department's achievements through this history have been groundbreaking and numerous. Just one example of the many as just one example, many of the current ground-based robotic systems that you see routinely used by police departments on the news can trace their origins right back here to Stumpneck, where the first generations of those systems were conceived and developed back in the early 1980s when we were developing remote control systems for earth-moving equipment that was designed to clear unexploded ordnance from the battlefield and contaminated areas. Since 9-11, the EOD department has fielded more than 3,000 robotic systems over 6,000 electronic countermeasure systems, responded to over 22,000 individual requests for EOD-specific information, and produced over 4,000 new EOD publications, adding to a library that currently totals over 10,000. The people of the EOD department are an integrated team of 320 civil servants and 80 contractors, organized into three primary divisions that are basically housed within three of the buildings you'll be touring today. Each of those tours is structured to give you a deeper dive look into what they do. So I really encourage you to take advantage of all of those so you can get a good big picture of what goes on here. You've heard a brief summary of some of the EOD department's most recent achievements a moment ago, but that just scratched the surface of what's actually been done here. You need to know this, your friends and family members who work here are doing fantastic things for the nation that are making vital contributions to our security every single day much of which simply can't be talked about openly because of sensitivity or classification concerns. But know this, that it is indeed happening right here and happening every day only because of the devotion, effort, and expertise of all the people who work here. And I am honored to serve them as the EOD department head. From the acquiring of previously unknown or unseen ordinance items to their disassembly and analysis to figure out how they work, how they can be defeated, to the exploitation of electronic control and triggering systems, to the development of render safe procedures, the analysis and gathering of intelligence to stay ahead of the threats, to the invention, development, and evaluation of energetic tools, explosive detection systems, underwater equipment, robotics, and the electronic countermeasure systems, to the worldwide logistics support of all of these things, what we do here in this very small spot at Stumpneck is absolutely amazing in its significance. You can be incredibly proud of your friends and family members who are part of this team and take comfort in the knowledge that the time they are spending here away from you is for a most noble purpose, and they are indeed fulfilling that purpose, making a difference for our nation's EOD warfighters every single day. That's a nice segue for me to introduce the leader of one group of those EOD warfighters, Commander Steve Duba, United States Navy, Officer in Charge, EOD Expeditionary Exploitation Unit 1, 
an EOD unit like none other and one that we are privileged to serve with here at NSWC Indian Head EOD Technology Division. Commander Steve Duba. Thanks for that introduction, Keith. Admiral, Captain Kraft, Brad, thanks for being here today. It really means a lot to us. I uh, just got off a plane last night, and uh, I'm really happy I was able to make it with our, uh, the gentleman you saw up here earlier, our man of the cloth, uh, Lieutenant Dan Davis. hoo -yah. So good morning, everyone, and hoo as we say in the Navy EOD and diving community. Weather turned out great. Thank God, because I've got Irish skin, and I need to keep it uh, in good condition. It's awesome to see so many family members of our Indian Head and EOD family here today for this wonderful event. It's an excellent opportunity for us to share our collective passion for the EOD technology and exploitation mission that contributes directly to our warfighters at the tip of the spear. Since 2003, and through several organizational and capability modifications, EXU-1 and the Warfare Center's Foreign Material Acquisition and Exploitation Branch have deployed forward across the globe as DODs and the Navy's premier force to conduct both tactical and operational exploitation of improvised explosive devices, weapons, and conventional ordnance. On land and at sea, oftentimes in hostile environments, to counter the violent, violent extremist organization threat abroad that threatens to do us harm. In fact, as we speak right now, EXU-1 exploitation professionals are deployed to 5th Fleet, 6th Fleet, and 7th Fleet, providing time-critical weapons technical intelligence to our supported Navy task forces and special operations forces and partner nations. All that being said, I'm truly convinced that without you, this group of patriots sitting in front of me, the families, the friends, and our coworkers here in Indian Head, our important mission would not be so successful, especially the families of our deploying personnel who sacrifice so much time, so much time away from home, training and deploying so that our loved ones can sleep safe, uh, safely at night and soundly this day is really for you. I'd like to give a round of applause for that. In an effort to keep this really short, because I'm sure everybody wants to move on to the festivities, um, without further ado, I have the honor and the pleasure of introducing a true patriot who is no stranger to self-sacrifice to defend this great nation and the flag flying over us today. Lieutenant Brad Snyder, please come forward. faster in the pool guys I'm sorry <laughs> all right thank you everyone for coming out this morning I know that it's pretty warm out here so I'll try to I just want to tell you a quick story then we can move on to the the tours specifically a tour of any place that has air conditioning so just real quick <laughs> So uh, my name is Brad Snyder. Uh, obviously, I'm not currently active duty given the beard and long hair, but I was once upon a time. Uh, I actually graduated from the Naval Academy in 2006. Uh, despite having a GPA of just a hair over 2.0, they gave me a, a, an EOD billet, which was really, a, I was very lucky to be able to do that. Uh, I went down to the new EOD school uh, down in, in uh, Destin, Florida. Uh, spent about a year learning how to dismantle every type of explosive you can from a hand grenade to a guided missile, to a nuclear weapon, and an improvised explosive device. Uh, moved to Charleston, South Carolina, where we used to have Mobile Unit 6. Uh, spent about eight months uh, getting worked up to deploy to Iraq. Uh, during that workup cycle was you know, around the, the tail end of 2007. The, our operational tempo in Iraq was incredibly high. While we were doing that workup, we were training with the robots that they developed here. Uh, we were thinking that we were going to see a really extensive combat, hundreds of IEDs in a six-month period. Uh, so we were kind of shocked to find when once, once we got to Iraq, they actually signed a new status of forces agreement saying that we were going to start our withdrawal uh, and uh, 
the, the province that I was deployed to, Dionia, was one of the first ones to turn over to Iraqi control. So instead of dismantling hundreds and uh, hundreds of IEDs, our, our mission rapidly changed to training the Iraqis on how to dismantle IEDs. Now, it's a really good thing we were there to do that because their chosen tactic at the time to dismantle an IED was to give a, a pair of clippers to their new guy, send him downrange, and say, good luck. They had this principle in Iraq called inshallah. Inshallah means if God wills him to live, he will live. If God wills him to die, he will die. And it was a good thing we were there because we, you know, we have lots of different ways that are all developed here uh, between uh, rigging and bomb suits and robots that we can te teach the Iraqis to do to, uh, to hopefully preserve their life. So I uh, spent about six months doing that. Uh, came back to uh, the East Coast here, moved from Charleston up to Virginia Beach. Got a new job, which I was really excited about. I was going to get to deploy to Afghanistan with a SEAL team. So I got to spend two years doing all the cool guy SEAL stuff that they do from jumping out of aircraft. Actually went to jump school with Commander Duba over there. Uh, went to jump school, got to do a lot of shooting, got to do a lot of blowing stuff up. And in uh, 2011, I thought I was a pretty cool high-speed guy, right? I had the opportunity to deploy to Afghanistan in 2011. Uh, when I got to Afghanistan, our job this time was to work with the Afghan commandos, which is a, a way of saying the Afghan special forces. Emphasis on special more than forces. They weren't necessarily up to our standard, uh, but we, it was our job there to get them up to speed as quickly as possible. Uh, so we did, we spent, we did about uh, 27 different combat operations between the spring of 2011 and the fall of 2011. Uh, our general mission profile was to load up two giant Chinook helicopters, uh, about 15 assaulters apiece, about 15 Americans, and 15 Afghan commandos. And we would go out to different places in the Kandahar area of Afghanistan doing assault missions where we would go into a village, uh, we would raid that village, we would look for Taliban fighters, Taliban weapons, uh, Taliban intelligence with the, the goal of doing two different things. Uh, one, mitigating the Taliban's presence in that particular area. Uh, the second being training those Afghan commandos to be able to do those same types of missions independently upon our withdrawal whenever that happens. So uh, on the morning of September 7th, 2011, we were on one such mission. Okay, we landed those two Chinooks in the middle of the desert, and due to the prevalent use of IEDs in that particular area, we made the tactical decision that the only safe way for us to get from one place to another was for an EOD tech like myself or my partner Adam to use our metal detector and clear everywhere we went. Okay, hundreds of IEDs all in a very small area, so we decided that I needed to be out in front of the patrol with a metal detector making sure that every footstep that our patrol took was safe. We cleared into the first village that we were supposed to go to and it was very eerie because nobody was in that village. There were no people, no Taliban, no women, no children, no goats, no cows, just the birds. I sat up on a rooftop that morning and watched the sunrise come over the mountains as we listened on uh, unsecure walkie talkies of Taliban fighters who were in the area who knew that we had landed and they were looking for us and they were going to try to amass an attack. So us being Americans, we said, we're not going to wait for them to attack us, we're going to go attack them. So we made the decision to move in their direction. I rock, paper, scissored with my buddy Adam, the other EOD tech. He lost I-1, so he decided or he was going to be the one to guide our patrol from one place to another. At about 7.30 in the morning, I saw the worst thing you can see in that particular time and place. I saw a big blast plume go up into the air, a gray cloud, a, a gray cloud, a mushroom cloud, okay? Uh, we make the tactical decision in that, in that particular environment not to rush to aid, right? It's very hard to do. I think in my mind that my buddy Adam just stepped on an IED and I need, I need to get up there and help him. But we live by this adage that where there's one bomb, there's more than likely many. So it's important for us to take a pause assess the situation, and make a smart decision. I waited for a really long time, hoping that my buddy Adam's voice would come over the radio and tell me that he was fine. But nothing came over the radio. I looked back at my boss, a SEAL lieutenant standing behind me, and said, I need to go help with the med medical evacuation. He said, Roger that. If we're going to bring a helicopter down to take out casualties, we're going to do it to the field to my left. I said, Roger that. I ran up to the front of the patrol where I found a choke point. I found a crumbled out spot of wall. Uh, right on the other side was a four foot, ditch, uh, four foot deep irrigation ditch. Uh, there was a big thick cloud of fog and debris and it was very hard for me to figure out what had gone on. I looked to my left and I was elated to see my buddy Adam was just fine. 
He was standing to my left and looking back at me with his arms in the air like, what happened? And I gave him the same gesture. What happened? I don't know. You were up here, right? I, I looked to my right and I saw about a meter and a half wide blast hole in the ground. What had happened was Adam had come up to that choke point, a, a, a place feared by all, especially EOD technicians, because we live by this adage that the path of least resistance is almost always booby trap. So as the EOD technician in the front of the patrol, all the SEALs tend to hate us because we choose the path of most resistance, which makes it very difficult to hike around Afghanistan, as you can imagine. So Adam correctly made the assessment that the way through over this ravine was to shimmy across on one side and jump across, jump across the ravine, okay? He and three other SEALs did the same thing, so they were all across the ravine just fine. The first Afghan commando to come up to that choke point looked across and said, I can't jump across that ravine in the way that those three guys did. He saw a crumbled out footpath across the ravine and decided he was going to go that way. But sure enough, there was a 40 pound IED buried in that path of least resistance. That Afghan commando stepped on that IED and was flung forward about 15 feet. The guy standing immediately behind him, both of his legs were taken off and he was laying unconscious in that hole. So we have two injured Afghan commandos that we need to take care of. Oh, by the way, those Taliban fighters talking on that walkie-talkie know, now know exactly where we are. There's a big black beacon up into the air exactly marking our location. We don't have a whole lot of time to get these guys out of here because we're encumbered by that casualty. The casualty was unconscious. He was missing both of his legs. His clothes were in tatters. And I was working with Afghan commandos that, that, that didn't speak English. So it was very difficult to work through that medevac situation. It took us about 10 minutes to pick up that casualty and move him backward about 100 feet to where we could safely land that helicopter to get those casualties to the hospital. I knew that we didn't have another 10 minutes uh, to, to figure out how to get that second casualty back to where the helicopter was going to land. So I ran back to the, the back of the patrol and grabbed a litter, which is basically a foldable gurney. Uh, I was running that litter back up to the front of the patrol when... I stepped on another IED that was about a meter away from the first blast hole. I remember waking up on the ground and I was in the fetal position and I looked down at a what vision out, uh, from what vision remained out of my left eye I could see my hands and beyond my hands I could see my boots. From my boots up to my knees to my chest to my hands I didn't see any damage. I didn't see any blood. Nothing was wrong. By that point in the deployment, I had seen a number of people uh, victimized by an IED, and none of them looked as pretty as I did in that particular moment. So I assumed that that meant that I had died. I died a half a world away from where I was born, in Afghanistan. So it's, a moment like that is very strange. It seems like you have an infinite amount of time to consider your reality, right? And your life doesn't flash before your eyes, it went very slowly. I had ample time to think across my entire life, from growing up on the, the Gulf of Florida, the Gulf of Mexico in Florida, to learning how to swim when I was you know, two or three years old, to going to the Naval Academy and uh, you know, despite being such a bad student, being able to throw my cap up in the air on that last day while the Blue Angels flew by. I thought about all the deployments I had made and the teammates I had, the EOD community, all the brothers I have here. And I thought, if you weighed all the stupid stuff and the good stuff I had done on a balance, I think I did a good job, right? I've done some really stupid things. I've done some good things too. And I think at the end, I'm happy with the life that I've lived. At 27 years old, I accepted and reconciled my death and I was happy to pass on. So I laid there I lay there and I remember looking at my watch thinking like, man, it takes a long time to die. But then uh, I had this sensation in my right ear. I had ruptured my eardrum in two places. It's a condition called tinnitus. It's this really bad ringing like And I thought, man, it's going to be really miserable to listen to this ringing for all of eternity, right? But then I realized something. I, I could, beyond the ringing, I could hear my buddy Adam calling to me. Brad, where are you? See, another big thick cloud of fog and debris had been kicked up by that blast and he couldn't find me. Adam was only about 15 feet away from me when that blast went off, but he, he couldn't find me. He's trying to help, he's looking for me. And that made me realize, I'm not dead. I'm still here. 
So Adam cleared over to me, he pulled me into that blast hole, he cut my gear off, and all of a sudden I started to panic. A moment ago I was okay with dying, but now I'm afraid to be alive. I'm afraid to be alive because I just took a 40 pound blast to the face. As an EOD tech, I know that that's not a good thing. What kind of damage did I suffer? Do I have a traumatic brain injury? Am I paralyzed? Is my face disfigured? Do I look like Rocky Road from the, the Goonies movie? So I remember grabbing Adam by his gear and I said, how bad is it? And he said, Brad, your, your face looks pretty messed up, but the rest of you looks fine. Do you think you can stand up? And uh, the way that he said that, he had a lot of confidence in his voice. Maybe it was adrenaline or something, but it gave me the confidence to say, it's, I'm okay. And with Adam's help, I'm gonna be all right. So Adam and the medic came over and stood me up and I was able to walk away from that blast. I walked back that 100 feet to where a helicopter came down. They loaded the, me and the other two guys on that helicopter and they took us to the hospital in Kandahar. Um, I had taken a bunch of frag to my neck so they were really worried about how I was able to breathe. So they were gonna intubate me. Being, uh, that means putting a tube down my throat. That's apparently a very unpleasant experience which I can very much attest to. So they put you asleep while they're gonna do that. They put me asleep in Kandahar and I didn't wake up for 60 hours. During those 60 hours, I spent 12 in surgery in Kandahar with a surgeon and her staff putting my face back together, kind of like Humpty Dumpty. Once I was medically stable in Kandahar, they flew me to Longstuhl Air Force Base in Germany where something happened to my eye in the flight, so they had to go back into surgery for another eight hours, another surgeon and their staff. Once I was medically stable, I was flown to Walter Reed Hospital just down the street in Maryland. All said and told, uh, uh, 60 hours. During those 60 hours, my mom got a phone call on the morning of September 7th, 2011, 5.30 in the morning. She answered the phone and a voice crackled from Afghanistan saying her son had been blown up. He's really badly injured, but don't worry, he's alive. He's asleep right now, so we won't be able to assess his cognition. We believe he probably has a traumatic brain injury, but we won't be able to know what the extent of that is until you get to Maryland. We need you to fly to Walter Reed Hospital as soon as you can. As you can imagine, that's a very tough phone call to receive. So I woke up in Walter Reed Hospital surrounded by my mom, my brothers, my sister, a whole host of surgeons and doctors and nurses and therapists. And it was a really difficult time for me because as you can imagine, I fell asleep in Afghanistan and I woke up in Maryland and I woke up on a really, really heavy dose of some pretty heavy opioid painkillers, right? If you pay attention to the news, the cocktail that killed Michael Jackson is a drug cocktail of Dilaudid, a painkiller, and Propothal, a sleep aid. I was on a heavy IV drip of both of those drugs. So my perception of the world was much more like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory than Walter Reed Hospital, right? So I'm hearing voices. I'm hearing my buddy Nick Maddox's voice. I'm hearing my mom's voice. I'm hearing doctor's voices. But in my imagination, it was much more like Oompa Loompas walking around, right? And Johnny Depp with a big tall top hat. And I kept asking my mom about the doctor with the top hat. And she said, the doctors don't wear top hats here, which was very disconcerting to me, as you can imagine. So it took me about six days, in and out of surgery for six days at Bethesda, doing different things to my face. Uh, it took me six days to wane off the painkillers to a point where I could understand what was going on. And on that sixth day, there was a really sobering conversation with these surgeons, four surgeons in the room, talking about a procedure that they were gonna do to try to save my vision. Save my vision? That really, I mean, that stuck out to me. I said, save my vision? I remember thinking back on those previous six days and I was so vividly imagining everything, it hadn't dawned on me that I wasn't seeing anything. And if I ever realized that I wasn't seeing anything, maybe I just thought that there was a bandage over my face and then at some point the bandage is gonna come off and I'll be able to see. Here this doctor was talking about saving my vision. So I asked that doctor, I said, what do you mean save my vision? He said, Lieutenant Snyder, if, you, if this surgery is a success, you have a less than 1% chance of being able to perceive light and dark with your right eye. Unfortunately, we have to remove your left eye completely so you'll see nothing on your left side. I realized in that moment that that doctor was telling me that I was blind and I would be blind for the rest of my life. Now, I believe we all hit these inflection points in our life, right? These major instances of trauma, 
and there's two paths you can go down. There's the left path and the right path. The left path is thinking about all the things that I'll never be able to do again. You best believe that the wise chain of command of the Department of the Navy is not going to let me anywhere near a bomb with clippers in my hand if I can't see what's going on, right? Is this the red wire, the green wire, who knows, but not me. So I'm not going to be able to do this job anymore. I'll never be able to drive a car. I'll never be able to fly a plane. One day, my baby sister is going to meet the man of her dreams. She's going to walk down the aisle in a beautiful white wedding dress. She's going to say, I do. I'll be in the pews, but I won't be able to see it. And that thought hit me really hard at that particular moment. But then I realized something. I realized that equally more important is the right path, the path of all the things that I still can do. I went to EOD school down in Florida with a buddy of mine named Tyler Trahan. Tyler and I were really best friends uh, during that whole experience. It was an amazing experience. It was very stressful, but as you can imagine, it was a lot of fun to, to go to school and learn the cool things that we learned, uh, but then go party on the beach in Destin, Florida every weekend, which was really awesome. Uh, as I was leaving Iraq, Tyler was getting there. He was just to start his first deployment. I got home and a week later I found out that Tyler Trahan was killed by a roadside bomb in 2009. When Tyler came back to the U.S., he was in a coffin with a flag draped over it. He's now buried in Freetown, Massachusetts, near where he grew up. Tyler doesn't get to come back and, and hang out with our brotherhood. He doesn't get to celebrate on the, the Gulf of Mexico and Florida anymore. He'll never get to hug his mom. I thought in that moment, how selfish of me would it be to victimize myself over the loss of my vision when Tyler lost his entire life. I made a commitment to myself, my family, and my community at that moment that I would live in honor of Tyler. I would make the most of every moment because that's a moment that he doesn't have and it's a moment that I do. So what if I can't see it? It doesn't mean that that moment isn't any more important. So I made that commitment with my family and I wish there was like this real cool picturesque movie moment, right? Where we all put our hands in a circle and we were like, blindness on three, one, two, three, blindness. But it didn't work like that, right? The, the hospital is an ugly place and it's difficult. And I literally was banging my head into the walls trying to figure out how to use a cane to find the bathroom and so on and so forth. But I was committed, right? I was committed and I was positive and I was finding ways to leverage a positive perspective and you know, honor my buddy Tyler with my, 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 my way forward. But overall, there's so many people coming to visit me in the hospital at that moment, right? There's lots of people, my friends, my family, people who found out about my injury in the newspaper or on Facebook. And they kept coming into my room and just being like, man, we're just so sorry. Gosh, this, this really stinks. We're so sorry. You know, I cried when I read the news. We were so sad to hear the news. We're so sorry. And I remember being really like, I, don't get me wrong, I, I love the sentiment and I, I was so appreciative to have such a supportive network, but I didn't like the pity and I didn't like the fact that I had made so many people sad. And I kept saying, guys, I'm okay, guys, look at me, I'm fine, and I'm really leveraging a positive perspective, and I'm living in honor of my buddy Tyler, and all these like motivational things. But nobody would believe it. And I realized it's because I've lived my life on this adage that I measure a man by what he does, not by what he says. And it was very potent in that moment to realize I was saying that I'm going to be fine. I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm okay. But nobody was going to believe it until they could see it. So I was really lucky that my swim coach, my old swim coach that I grew up swimming with in Florida, he was in that line of people. But instead of coming into my room and saying that he was sorry and that he wanted to pity me, all he said was, we're going to have practice on Saturday. You want to be there? I said, yeah, coach. I want to be at practice. So that following Saturday, just like I did every Every day from the age of six all the way through 18, I hopped in my mom's Honda Civic. We drove down to the pool, and I did swim practice with my old swim coach. What I found when I hopped in the pool, for me, was the first thing that I didn't suck at blind, and it was awesome. It was really great for me to go, you know, it was really difficult for me to go from that person who was an EOD tech deployed with a special operations force in Afghanistan. I'm capable of jumping out of aircraft. I'm capable of scuba diving. I'm capable of literally taking a bomb apart with my own, my own fingers. And now blind, I'm struggling at everything, finding the food on my plate to picking out what shirt to wear in the morning. It was really difficult. It was a blow to my self-confidence. But swimming was the first thing that I could do. And not only could I do it, I could do it well. 
I didn't need adaptive equipment. I didn't need a talking iPhone. I didn't need a guide dog. I didn't need a cane. I could do it all by myself. So it was the first place that I was able to start picking up those pieces and rebuilding my sense of self-purpose. More importantly, my mom, my coach, and my community were around that pool deck watching me swim. And they saw the person that I was. They didn't see this struggling, blind, wounded veteran. They saw Brad Snyder the way that I wanted them to see me. And thankfully, someone at the, on that pool deck was watching me swim, and they're like, man, that guy's pretty good at swimming. Have you ever thought about the Paralympics? He ran over and talked to my mom about Paralympics. And when we were like, you mean like Special Olympics? And they're like, no, 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 Paralympics. It's just like the Olympics, but it's for those with physical disabilities. They have it every four years. It's in the same venues as the Olympics. You know, the Olympics wraps up, and they spend about two weeks putting wheelchair ramps everywhere. And, you know, did you realize how lucky you are to be injured in an Olympic year? <laughs> and I said, no, I hadn't thought of it that way, but I'm all about a positive perspective, so thank you, yeah. So uh, we went back, we did some Googling of our own, and then we, uh, we found that there was going to be a swim meet at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. So I, I flew to that swim meet, and I swam a 50-meter freestyle. I dove off the block, swam across, and I hit the wall, and I got out. And everybody in that arena was like, man, that was super, super cool. You know, you're the fifth fastest swimmer in the world now in blind swimming. And, uh, you know, I've been swimming competitively for 20 years. I knew it couldn't be that easy. So I told all of them, no, 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 you guys. You're looking at the wrong list, right? You're looking at the list of people who are left-handed, who are from Maine, uh, and I'm not on that list. I'm from Florida, so you know, thanks, good job. But I, I, I'll go, I'll go do the googling for myself, right? So I went and did the googling for myself, and I realized they were right. I was the fifth fastest blind swimmer in the world at that particular point back in uh, February of 2012, and that had earned me a spot on the Paralympic national team and an invitation to go to the Paralympic trials, which would be a couple months later in Bismarck, North Dakota, of all places. So we flew to Bismarck, North Dakota. We did the Paralympic swimming trials, and I swam two events that I'm better suited for, the 100-meter freestyle and the 400-meter freestyle. And I raised that number five to a number one world ranking. I was the fastest blind swimmer in the world in July of 2012. You know, in July of 2011, I wasn't even a blind person. In July of 2012, I was the fastest blind swimmer in the world. So it was a quick transition. So I moved to Baltimore, Maryland. I started training with uh, the, the, the best blind swimming coach in the world, Brian Leffler at Loyola, Loyola University. And I remember this really cool day where Brian came out of his office and he had a piece of paper in his hand. He said, hey, Brad, they just published the order of events for the London Paralympic Games. Do you want to go through it and come up with our strategy? I said, yeah, coach, that sounds like a good idea. So uh, he started going through the list of events and he said, on day one, you're going to have the 100 meter freestyle which is uh, not your best event, but it'll be a good opportunity to get your feet wet, pardon my pun. And then he said, on day two, you're gonna swim the 100 meter breaststroke, which is your worst event, but we're still gonna do it because there's all these weird international rules and it's good to get used to swimming in front of a big crowd and so on and so forth. And then he got quiet. He said, on September 7th, 2012, you're gonna have the opportunity to swim the 400 meter freestyle. Now the significance of that September 7, 2011 is exactly the day that I lost my vision in Afghanistan. September 7, 2012, I'd have the opportunity to don a new uniform. Instead of my naval uniform, which I hung in my closet, I'm going to wear this uniform of Team USA. I'm going to go to London, I'm going to compete for my country, and I'm going to swim in a race that I'm favored to win by 20 seconds. You can't write a better sports story than that, right? <laughs> so as you can imagine, leading up to the games, there's like all this media attention and interviews and stuff. But uh, well, it's, it's the Paralympics. So there was a guy in Philly who wrote an article. <laughs> and I remember, I remember that sports writer asking me this question. He said, uh, Lieutenant Snyder, are you nervous to compete in the Paralympics for the first time? And unfortunately, I said the first arrogant thing that popped in my mind. I said, no. I said, sir, I used to defuse bombs in Afghanistan for a living. Like, how hard could Paralympics be, right? And he laughed, and he put that in the article, and it went out into the Facebook, Twitter sphere. And I remember reading that article afterward and I thought, ah, that was a real dick thing to say. Like, <laughs> she didn't say stuff like that. I tell you what, I really re regretted that remark. When I went to London, and I got off the plane, and I walked to the Paralympic village, I'm walking around the Paralympic Village where there's athletes from all over the world talking in different languages about their different events, from wheelchair basketball to goalball uh, to swimming. 
I walked into a cafeteria the size of three football fields where you can get any food you want from any corner of the world, from sushi to stromboli to the, jet, the biggest McDonald's that I've ever been in in my life. Then I walked into a swimming arena, a swimming arena surrounded by 18,000 seats. I thought back across my competitive swimming career spanning 20 years, what's the biggest crowd you think I ever swam in front of? About this size, a couple hundred people. And in that crowd, it's everybody's mom. And everybody's mom's up in the stands looking at Pinterest for brownie recipes, right? Like, they're like not really paying attention to what's going on in the pool. Every race for 20 years, I would go out and talk to my mom afterwards. She'd say, did you have fun? <laughs> not in London, man. 18,000 screaming European hooligan fans, right? Who paid 80 pounds for those tickets and they're three Guinnesses deep. So you best imagine that they're going to make the most of that experience, right? Now, races in the Paralympics are different than any race that I'd ever done before. You have to check into your event 45 minutes in advance. And you have to get inspected, like a military-style inspection. There's all these goofy international rules, right? You can't have certain tattoos. Your suit has to have a QR code saying that it's an approved FINA suit. Your goggles can only say Speedo one time. Your cap has to have a certain sized flag and it can only be on one side and the font of your name has to be so sad, blah, 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 blah. So you have to get inspected with all these different rules. And then you sit down in these chairs. There's six sets of eight chairs. Eight chairs, eight swimmers, eight lanes. This represents the evening's program of events. As each heat walks out onto the pool deck to swim their respective race, you advance in these sets of chairs. The first set of chairs, it's very quiet. It's in this weird, like, closet style room. All you can hear is the AC above you and the iPod of the guy next to you, which I found rather humorous because he was from China. He didn't speak a lick of English. What do you think he's listening to? Hotel California by the Eagles. <laughs> well, a referee comes over at that moment and escorts you to the next set of chairs, and then the next set. You get closer and closer and closer to that arena where there's 18,000 screaming European hooligan fans are going nuts, right? And uh, apparently while I was asleep in the hospital, they invented dubstep music, which is very peculiar if you've never heard that before. So they're playing dubstep music super loud in this arena. And then all of a sudden, this voice from way up above in the sky says, Please welcome your competitors for the S11 400 meter freestyle. It's my event. So we walk out on the pool deck and it is so loud on the pool deck it feels like the world is vibrating, right? And you walk out and you go in and if you're not nervous enough at that particular moment, as swimmers we basically strip down into an undergarment in front of 18,000 people, right? If you're not nervous in a particular moment, I promise you, you will be nervous in that moment. But the USOC, the United States Olympic Committee, gives us all these really great resources leading up to the games like that. Uh, and they gave us a sports psychologist, right? And the sports psychologist gives us all these mental tactics to navigate a difficult situation like that. And one of those tactics is called self-talk. You guys ever heard of self-talk? It goes like this. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. Gosh darn it, people like me. That's a borrowed joke. Um, so I'm doing my self-talk routine, right? As I'm taking off my garments, putting them in a basket, I'm telling myself, don't worry, nobody's looking at you. There's like this really jacked, good-looking dude from Spain in lane three. They're all looking at him. And at that particular moment, they say, Swimming in lane four for the United States of America will be Brad Schneider. <laughs> now I know they're all looking right at me. But something cool happens at that moment. My coach took my hand and he put it on the block. And I stood up next to that pool and I could very vividly imagine the block, the fin at the back, the sandpapery surface. I stood up to the pool and I could vividly imagine the two lane lines on either side, the clear blue water, the long black line on the bottom of the pool. 50 meters in front of me, there's a wall on the other side. All I have to do is swim eight lengths of that pool, 400 meters. Nobody in that pool is better prepared than I. I've been at war and back twice. I've been swimming competitively for 20 years. I'm the strongest version of myself at the age of 28 years old. All I got to do is swim eight lengths. My favorite moment in sports, the referee blows the whistle, the whole arena goes dead quiet.
He blows the whistle one more time. We step up on that block. Take your mark. And I dove off, right? Now, I make this joke that blind swimming is very unique. It's a little bit like NASCAR, right? All those 18,000 people, when we dive off, their reaction goes like this. Because if you think about it real hard, it's eight totally blind dudes who are just trucking down the lane. What's inevitably, inevitably going to happen? Somebody's going to crash, right? So that's exactly what's going through my mind. It's just, please don't crash. Please don't crash. And the statistician in me knows that every length I get under my belt is one less chance that I have of crashing, right? So I feel confident and more confident every lap I get done. So I get, I, you know, I get out to that first lap, no problem. The adrenaline's sky high, I feel nice and smooth. I get through that first flip turn, I'm all set. I get into that second length, I'm feeling good still. Second length is done, I do my second turn. I come off and now my fatigue is starting to set in a little bit. I creep over that left-hand lane line, I brush up against it a little bit, but luckily I catch it with my hand. I, I can push myself back into that clean water in the middle of the lane. Three is done, I'm coming in for the halfway point. I get through that fourth flip turn, I'm halfway done. I'm gonna start to build in my legs, control that third hundred with my legs. I get through that la uh, the second to last wall, I'm coming in, I'm on my last hundred, I'm getting real excited, the crowd is super loud. I'm on my last hundred, I feel really good, I get through that last turn, I come into the wall. Now this funny thing happens in blind sports that doesn't happen in any other sport, right? What happens, we all watched Michael Phelps, the GOAT, right? Rio. 33 gold medals or whatever it is, right? Phelps comes in and he wins a race and what happens? He looks up at a jumbotron that's got his face like the size of a football field, right? And it says Michael Phelps wins again, oh my god! Exclamation mark and smiley face emojis and fireworks and stuff. So Michael Phelps gets super excited, right? What's he do? Fist pump! Fist pump! Two fist pumps! Victory, right? He looks over at Team USA and he's like, yeah, Team USA, we're the best! And he looks up at his mom, he's like, Mom, get off of Pinterest, I win again. <laughs> None of that happens in blind sports because we can't see the jumbotron. So I finished what I perceived to be the race of my life, right? I finished this race, I, I felt really good, my adrenaline was really high. There's this great tagline story, Navy sailor gets blown up, wins a gold medal on the year anniversary, the day he lost his vision, blah, blah, blah. It feels really, really good, I, I feel good, right? And I got this like tingly sensation in my hand. What do I want to do? I want a fist pump, but what kind of idiot am I going to look like if I start fist pumping, but the guy in lane eight had the race of his life, and the whole crowd just looks down going, oh, it's just so tragic. <laughs> so not wanting to look like an idiot, I just sit there. All 18,000 people in that arena know what happened. They can see the Jumbotron. They're super excited and they're cheering super loud. And oh yeah, that voice from way up there, they're announcing what happened, but all it sounds like to me is <laughs> I'm trying to get the water out of my ear. What did you say? Huh? What happened? So I hear the guy next to me finish. So at least I beat him, right? And so I like my my inclination is to lean over and say like, "Yo, dude, like what happened?" But he doesn't know. He's blind too. He's from the Ukraine anyway, he doesn't speak any English, so we all just sit there. Second favorite moment in sports. When all the competitors have finished, the referee blows that whistle again. And that means my coach can now lean over and talk to me. And he said two words I'll never forget. He said, you won. That story came true. I won a gold medal on the exact year anniversary of the day I lost my vision in Afghanistan. Now, I promise there's a moral to the story. We're almost there, so stick with me. So winning a gold medal is a really fun experience, right? Now I know all those people are cheering for me, which is great. So I wave to them, and they're super happy, and I wave to them, and they're super happy. And I go talk to the media from Sweden and Japan and Brazil and all these other countries I've never been to, uh, and I'm super excited about that. And then I go take a P-test to make sure I'm not doping, and then I go put on my Team USA uniform, and I go to the podium. The podium is a cool podium kind of like this. Um, a podium is a cool moment, right? Because for a moment, this delegate from London comes over and puts a medal around your neck, gives you a bouquet of flowers. They do a little European kissy kiss thing. And in that moment, it's cool because it's like, that a boy, Brad. You did something cool and we're all proud of you. But that's a fleeting moment. Why? Because a moment later, they play the anthem and they raise our flag higher than all those other flags in that arena. 
And as I stood at attention listening to that anthem, I realized that those 50 stars and 13 stripes stood for something so much greater than me. I thought back to my buddy Adam and the medic Kyle who picked me up when I was down on the battlefield and they got me to, where that, to that helicopter where that pilot put himself, his flight crew, and his aircraft at risk to land in a hostile zone to take me to the hospital where a surgeon and her staff spent 12 hours putting my face back together to the same crew who did the same thing in Longstuhl Air Force Base in Germany to the same crew who did the same thing in Walter Reed Hospital for six days in a row. To my mom who got that call at 5.30 in the morning saying her son had been blown up. We need you to get to Maryland as quickly as possible. To my brothers and my sister who wrapped their arms around my mom and got her through that tough experience. To the EOD community that I'm a part of that I deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan with. To the greater Navy community that we're all a part of. To being a, an American in general. I realized that individuals never accomplish anything truly great. It's when communities leverage their collaborative efforts towards a cohesive goal, that's where magic happens. That's where gold medals are possible. It was a very humbling experience to stand on that podium and be a cog in that wheel, to be a representative of what can happen when a community bands together. So why is this relevant to where we are here and today? Memorializing the story of our heroes, the EOD legends, is incredibly important because it contextualizes our efforts. We have to understand that our efforts are a small piece of a much bigger puzzle. By participating and being excellent in our own way, we participate in the legacy of the EOD community. I have this thing, it was difficult for me to lay to rest Tyler. It was difficult for me to lay to rest Jason Finan and Scott Dayton. But I gained solace by keeping them with me. You don't know this, but Tyler is here with us. He's sitting in the crowd. Jason's with us. Scott is with us. I keep them with us because I always ask them, will you be proud of me when I do this? Any action that I'm gonna take, any speech that I give, any race that I do, I ask them. Is this something that you would be proud of? And that's how I govern my efforts towards their legacy. These memorials are incredibly important because they allow us to remember our place in the much greater legacy of the EOD community. Thank you guys very much. I'm here, friend. Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much, Brad. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I'd like to introduce our Command Master Chief, Master Chief Chris Borkenheim. Again, good morning, everyone. Uh, we gather here today on this 116-year-old annex to not only celebrate the rich history of our Joint Service EOD, but to also share with you, our families and friends, the, fu the fruits of our labor and support of the EOD Warfighter. The NSWC Indian Head EOD Technology Division mission consists of three key elements. Fly farther, hit harder, and save lives. My portion of today's ceremony focuses on the third element, save lives. Or as, as you may have seen on the billboard entering the annex, keep them off the wall. Quoting from the NSWC Indian Head EOD Technology Strategic Plan, we accomplished this by ensuring our Joint Service EOD Warfighters critical tools, equipment, and information provide an unfair advantage over our adversaries' capabilities. This is what the EOD Department and EXU-1 does on a daily basis. The original EOD Memorial previously located on Indian Head proper was dedicated on 12 June 1970. When NAV School EOD moved from Indian Head, Maryland to Eglin Air Force Base on 17 March 1999, the memorial was deconstructed and re relocated accordingly. In an attempt to keep our mem the memory of our fallen Joint Service EOD warfighters alive in Indian Head, the memorial marker in front of you today was constructed of engraved brass, the brass plaque 
and 74 bricks extracted from the original EOD memorial during deconstruction and was emplaced on the Stump Neck Annex on 1 May 2016. I have to say this, this would not have been accomplished without the hard work of retired Master Chief Bob Zimmerman and Dan Burgunyev. So if you're in the crowd, please stand up. This EOD memorial marker is neither meant to replace the official EOD memorial, nor is it an attempt to take away from the significance of the annual EOD memorial ceremony, which occurs the first Saturday in May of every year. But instead, this EOD memorial marker provides us with a daily reminder to remain focused on our mission and to ensure that we, we as a team, are doing our very best each and every day to prevent additional names from being added to the cinegraphs memorializing our fallen joint service EOD heroes. Thank you again for coming today. We will never forget. Thank you, Master Chief. At this time, Lieutenant Davis will now deliver the benediction. Please join me in prayer. Lord, uh, we thank you so much for um, the memorial we have here. We thank you so much for the uh, wonderful words of Brad Snyder and uh, the inspirational message that he provided us. Uh, Lord, it uh, just helps us to remember the work we do here and how important it is. We thank you again so much that uh, you bless us with this beautiful weather and uh, a nice little drizzle sprinkle to uh, cool us off a little bit, Lord. Uh, we ask you to bless the rest of our day, bless the, uh, the family day, and bless the time we have. And, uh, may this just be a, a reminder of, of what we do here and the importance of, of what, we, what we have going on Stump Neck Annex. These things we pray in your name. Amen.